morning. Welcome to the Garden Discovery Series on this second Saturday in May. This is a collaboration between the Botanic Garden Foundation, which are the volunteers that help with the gardens out here, and this wonderful Goodwood Library that provides the conference room and all the audio visual for this event. I am Mary Tharp. I am taking the place of Juliet Chapo, who at the last minute was unable to present this program. I stepped in on Friday, and so I was very fortunate. I'm a master gardener, and I'm certified through the LSU Ag Center to present this program to you. And I thank the Master Gardeners Archives for this wonderful PowerPoint by Pat Rutherford on the colorscapes. So I'm going to take you through her PowerPoint with my commentary today. Um, so we'll just talk a little bit about color. You picked up your color wheels, which will give you some in inside information about choosing colors. Look at this garden, how luscious it is. Uh, doesn't it just draw you in? It's warm and friendly. We've got every color here that we can think of. Um, I see white, and don't forget that white is a color. And keep your eye open as I go through these slides. I may not mention the little piece of white that you'll see throughout these gardens. Blue and lavender and purple and yellow and all of those different shades of green. And then we can design a garden. It's like painting on a canvas. I can't paint. I have no uh, inclination for that. But I could do this. I could lay this out. First, you start with your hardscape. That is your walkways, how you want to proceed through a garden space. Um, and then you lay out your flower beds as you walk through your garden in your yard. And this is kind of formal. Look at how the whites go and the purples and the reds. Uh, I am not a formal type of gardener, but as we walk through our garden, we'll see different phases of gardening. We have a parterre, which is a very formal type of an arrangement for a garden, which we, looks more like this one that you see here. And look at the blend here of these colors of yellow and orange with that brick how they complement each other. This is what you want to think of when you're looking at your landscape and trying to make it blend. Um, there are plenty of books that will help you. In fact, when we picked up this one color wheel, I think we had 25 to choose from, and what <laughs> we didn't know which one would be best. But So we'll use the one that we were able to print out for you. And so. Just take the artist and the easel out of this picture and look at your background. Even pine mulch is a color that will add to your garden. And it's blending here with the white as, and the greens. And the fence, if you notice in the fence, the iron fence in the back, it adds a texture, an element to your garden. So think of that if you have a fenced yard, whether it be wood or the iron like that. And looking at your color wheel, we've learned through in our Master Gardener training that you've got your warm colors and you've got your cool colors. Your warms are your reds and yellows and those that come from that. And we use the red because we think it adds energy and excitement to a space. If you want to draw someone up to your front door, put some red and yellow along your walkway, and they'll find the path. The cool ones are kind of soothing, and you'll see them more in a shady garden. They reflect uh, peace. But uh, if you were wanting to mix these colors, now this chart is not the same as yours, but that's why there are so many different ones. You've got colors that are opposite each other that are called complementary colors. So you would feel comfortable putting a yellow with a violet or a blue-green with a red-orange. And you would feel that those complement each other. You know, you talk about matching your clothes. 
That's kind of the idea. These harmonize. These look good together. And that's your thought in your color wheel. So this is for just to help you when you walk into that nursery with all of those colors that you don't know what to do with. And this color wheel will give you an idea. Oh, I like that one. And I'm brave enough to take this flower from that table, that flower from that table, and take them and put them around and see if they're in harmony with each other. That Latin nursery people aren't going to fuss with you if you do that. It's just hard to look at all the colors and say, oh, I think that one will go with that one, and it not necessarily will be so. Look at this beautiful plumbago. Now, isn't it just wonderful by itself? It's blue, and it's the green foliage. That's all you need along this walkway. Uh, someone might think, oh, let's put in a little bit of this, a little bit of that at the base. There's no need to do that. It's luscious just like it is. Now, plumbago wants full, full sun. And you can get a plant growing to two to five feet. And uh, so you have to think about the sun in your garden at different times of the day. Go out in the morning. Go out at noon. Go out in the late afternoon. See where your sun is coming or going. And there's that red. Doesn't it just excite you? Doesn't it just bring you in? You could follow that red into your garden. And then I want to talk about monochromatic. Those are the ones that are all the same color, maybe a few little lighter shades or darker shades, what have you. But this is effective in a smaller space. I wouldn't put a long flower bed in that unless that really pertains to your likeness. And color is your eye, not what someone else thinks or the neighbor or the book or the nursery uh, person helping you out to buy your flowers. You trust your eye. You know what you like. And these are our poppies. Oh, no, excuse me, there's the petunias. And those are very plentiful right now. Then there's the analogous color. If you look at your color wheel and break it into four quadrants, each quad quadrant will provide you the analogous colors. These colors go well together. And as I told you, what's sitting right in the middle of that screen, those analogous colors, white. So white is color. It adds an element. And we see that these are complementary. They have all of the yellows and the violets mixed together. And I said, look, work with contrast. Look at the colors right here with the sweet potato vine and the coleus. And just imagine how effective that would be to walk into the back and see that. You can tell that I prefer the warm, vibrant colors. I love my red, reds and yellows. I love yellow. I don't wear yellow. So don't think about uh, coloring your garden as to what you actually wear every day. Um, it may vary that, from the colors in your closet. And so the sweet potato vines are kind of like a, a low ground cover. Coleus doesn't get too large. This appears to, in this slide to be huge, but it, it's not. And green, green is wonderful. Here it is, just a few little zinnias popping up among all of the green color, and how restful that is, as opposed to that coloring combination. So you can see with your eye that, oh, I like those better than I like the others. Uh, and look at this. This is a wonderful uh, comic. Uh, we're supposed to color the rectangles yellow and the color, the circles, blue. But when you have 244 selections, what is yellow and what is blue? And that's probably how you feel when you go to the nursery. They don't necessarily lump the colors together. They'll lump the plants together, and plants have varying colors. If you really want to play, take a box of crayons, a dozen at the most, 
take out some white paper and put the colors together and see how you see them. Well, I do like that violet, and I actually like the violet with blue, not yellow. So that's kind of a way to play before you start to go and buy your plants. You've got to consider the light in your garden. I mentioned that earlier, that you have to spend some time outside morning, noon, and afternoon watching that sun come uh, over and across. And moisture, well, most of us have to irrigate in some fashion in Louisiana. We are not so lucky as to have a, a good element of moisture. And season, uh, I tried pansies for the first time this fall in, into winter. I don't know why I had never tried them before, and they're the most wonderful purple. I just took them out yesterday. I couldn't bear because they were still blooming. So seasonally, check your nursery and see what is available that you might like to have in your garden. And think about existing structures and plantings. Uh, and this, I think, is most important. Where are you when you look at your garden? Are you looking out your kitchen window, out of your dining room window, living room? or you're outside on your patio. I have a rocking chair on a little small patio, and that's where I watch my garden grow. So that's how I see, oh, I, oh, I need a little color over there. And I'll think about it, and then I'll go to the nursery and find what color I'd like to put in that spot. So as I said, sun is so important. They have a beautiful butterfly on lantana. And shade, of course. My whole front yard is shade. When I moved into my house 10 years ago, I had the tiniest little tree, and it was full sun. Now, that's, now that tree has shaded the whole front yard. So I have to adapt, and I have to put in more ferns and items that really do like the shade. And look at this rutabecchia. We also know this is coneflower. Now, do you I suspect that these people who are looking out these windows are enjoying this grand display. And of course, there's that white again. And this uh, little vine, that's a, a morning glory. And it's as white and it's as pretty. The contrast between the green and the white is so lovely. And uh, you would enjoy looking at that. Don't uh, put aside uh, art or sculpture or even a little walkway over a bayou like this one and paint it red. Uh, when I w went through these slides, it's inspired me to paint my rocking chair. It right now is just plain old brown wood. Let's make that vibrant blue or some color that would be fun to sit in. So you can see that that adds to your garden. And there again is our white. But doesn't that just look like peace to you? It, you want to go sit there in that wonderful, lush, shady garden. And here's one that I find too busy. Uh, there just seems to be one of everything. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to be coordinated to me. And uh, I would imagine who ever has this yard has a big yard and can spread out. Mine is so tiny, I've got to be more conformist in how I lay it out. But this may apply to people. We have grasses out in our botanic garden that uh, really add by the way they've been placed in that garden. So it, but it, you've just got every color under the sun here, your whole color wheel. Now this is an idea. Just take a small space and probably just a container and work with different color combinations in a small container before you spend the money to spread out into your flower beds. Uh, I like that idea. Then think about other sources. Uh, edible fruit. My satsuma tree in the fall and late into December is just so beautiful with those dark, dark green leaves and that 
orange, orange fruit. It alone is just a delight to look at. Uh, and berries, I have blueberry bushes, and they just are delightful also. And then you can see these berries. This is on Nandina, and it is just luscious to look at the difference between the green and the red. And don't forget trees in your landscape. The bark is very interesting. Your Natchez crepe myrtles that have that beautiful reddish bark and peel and make a lot of mess, but still, to look at the bark, it's lovely. Then uh, you could look at this. I think I like this spacing. You've got the foxglove, you've got the ornamental banana, a green ground cover, one lone little tree in the back there, and some yellow uh, flowering shrub that I couldn't recognize because it seemed distant in the picture. But there's a lot of contrast, but it, I like the way it looks. I like the way it kind of draws me into that space. And then you can go up one color per season. For instance, your red in the autumn. I believe these are amaryllis. I am not sure. The slide was difficult to determine. But uh, I have a huge red amaryllis. I just have large clumps of them throughout my yard. And when they bloom, it's just gorgeous. And then you, pink in the summer, that is phlox, and it's beautiful. And of course, our daylilies in the spring, and we're, we're going to end our tour in the garden, in the daylily garden, which is in full bloom right now. And our member of our botanic garden, Claire Fontenot, has spent decades working with the daylilies. That each one is identified. And we have quite a historic collection of daylilies in our garden here. And then I was talking to you about my pansies, purple in winter, and how wonderful. They didn't die during the ice storm. They were there still looking at me. And I thought, well, how wonderful. So I'll do pansies again for the next coming year. And look at uh, white and gray. Now, I had a difficult time in looking at this slide, identifying the gray. Um, we do have Dusty Miller in our botanic garden, and when we pass through the parterre, we'll see that. I think that is the most prominent plant for adding a gray color to your garden. And I again added that this winter, and it did beautifully through the ice storm. This is really a fun walkway. They've just put down pieces of slate to make a path. But it draws you, doesn't it? it? The yellow, you kind of go forward towards it. And the uh, lots of yellow, you've got a bench in the uh, background there, a little sculpture. So kind of be adventurous with your garden. Uh, there was recently a garden on uh, tour with the Hilltop Arboretum, and the owner had wonderful little whimsical sculptures in his garden that attracted you and brought you to a point where you looked and then you could look more around your garden and see what was going on. So have fun because it's just a wonderful time to be thinking about the y color in your garden. And I thank you very much for listening with us. If anyone has any questions, uh, be sure to let it be your eye that makes the decision about the color. And I thank you very much. Can you grow wildflowers in your flower bed? You absolutely can. So we're calling them prairie flowers now. And I think even the nurseries are supporting that. It's a na we're looking for native plants in our gardens. And so you can intersperse uh, wildflowers. Don't forget you can intersperse herbs in your garden because they also will add a texture, a nice area to look at, but also be very useful. 
you're going to see the rosemary herb growing here in the Botanic Garden outside of the sensory garden, which is all herbs, but along a walkway. And you'll see that it adds a nice color and texture to the walk. Were there any other questions, Ms. Jessica? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he was asking if Nandina berries are poisonous for birds. If you really are watching your Nandina, the birds aren't coming. I think they know that that is not a good berry for them. And uh, also, there was a question about Confederate jasmine being harmful for honeybees. And that's an unknown question. Uh, I asked one of our beekeepers that's on one of our boards about that. He said he didn't know that was the case. But they're not going to go there. They seem to be intelligent enough, birds and bees, to take, go where they find the best food. And your other question? Whether morning glories uh, as a vine is invasive. Uh, I find with vines, you have to control them. They will just take over if you're not careful. And uh, so I have Confederate jasmine, which is not bothering my honeybees, on a trellis. And so I can keep the areas along the side controlled so it doesn't just take over the whole fence. Uh, my brother's fence in New Orleans I remember when we planted the Confederate jasmine along the iron fence, they were just scraggly little sprigs. You should see it now. It is glorious and full. But if they don't take care of it every fall, it just will take over the yard. So you have to watch your vines very carefully. Okay. That was about the wildflowers and interspersing them along your flower beds. The comment was hilltop operatum cells the seeds, right, for planting. So if you were interested, do go over and see their prairie meadow, and you can see how the wildflowers and the native flowers are growing beautifully. And it's a comment about considering a nighttime garden. I've just really been talking about the daytime and the sun flowing and what have you, but yes, Nighttime gardens are beautiful, and uh, the comment was that if you're going to put a, a lavender in there, it's not going to really show, but a white will and a pink will. There's the night blooming cereus plant that only blooms at night, and uh, several of my friends have those and will call me up, you know, maybe about 11:30 at night. It's blooming, it's blooming. So uh, a night garden is very nice, also. Okay, I think uh, uh, I want to introduce John Huff. He's the president of the Botanic Garden Foundation, and I think he had some words to tell you about the Source magazine. Thank you, Mary. Okay, uh, for those of you in the room, I encourage you to pick up a copy of this publication called The Source. Uh, it is a really good publication that the library puts out on a monthly basis. Uh, and uh, we, with each of these programs, which are, take place on the second Saturday of any given month, we always like to have a reading list associated with whatever the topic is. This month's reading list is, is inside the source, and there's all kinds of information about e-books, e-magazines. I didn't even know they existed. Uh, also, any printing books associated with color, children's gardening books. Uh, and additionally, uh, I want to encourage you to look at this. Uh, by the way, this is available uh, online. If you go to the library, you can find this entire publication. Uh, if you become a patron of the library, they will mail it to you in the US mail, which I, I, I love the fact. Uh, the, additionally, in here, there are garden friends. You'll see uh, websites for all the garden entities in Baton Rouge, which to me is very important. Uh, and. Uh, I want to let you know, it also says in here about our next Garden Discoveries presentation, which is going to be on June the 12th. It's about bees. Uh, the topic is Be a Bee. It's very good for children if you want to bring children or grandchildren to this event. Uh, and then the, most, the coolest thing about working with the library and having them do this through Facebook Live is that all the previous 
pub, uh, presentations are available through Facebook Live, and the URL is right there on, in this book. So I encourage everyone in the room to pick, one, pick up one of these and check with the library to find previous uh, garden discoveries presentations. Uh, for those of us in the room, we're getting ready to take a garden tour. We'd like to take about a five minute uh, uh, necessary break, which is right outside this door, and then please come back in this room and we'll lead a garden discoveries uh, walking tour out this door in this room. So five minute break. Thank you all very much. Here we have Diane with the yellowing of variegated abelia. We do a lot of trial work with plants here in the garden. And this particular walkway is called the classic Southern walkway. Most of our plants have been donated to us and they're used in trials. We give reports back as to how they're doing. You can see this is called intense sun on this walkway. This is the second time it's been planted. The first time the plants just couldn't withstand the intense sun through the summertime. It's the bronze wall. That is a red crepe myrtle. It's very unusual, isn't it? Has that devil and we have one right over here. It's quite large, it's doing well. Oh, that's the Yeah. Okay. Yes, I was A very popular rose right now is called Drift Rose, and they come in beautiful colors. This is a brilliant red. And they're really kind of short. You'll notice the difference when we go in the rose garden, how a naturally formed rows will look opposed to the drifts that, that kind of bunch together. Mary, you might mention these were donated by PDSI and these are Southern Southern Living Plant Collection too. Yes, I mentioned that these are trials that from donations to us. Southern Living It's a company called Plant Development Services Incorporated, and they donated all these to the Panic Guard. This beautiful uh, violet flowering brush uh, bush is a uh, Budlia, tracks butterflies, and it, look, it's just coming into its own, ready to explode. And here's a little dwarf elephant ear. Look at its coloring. It would be lovely. Um, we're trying to see how it works in the sun. Usually it does better in the shade. So I just put two patio umbrellas up over top of it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it was free, so like we hurried up and got it in the ground so it wouldn't die. And then uh, it was kind of burning. So, and here's rosemary. Didn't I say that it looks nice in a bed? It is, has a lot of texture and color of its own. So we put it out, and it gets a lot of evening sun, you know, afternoon sun. And then first year, the leaves got all burned and they were curling off. And these are dwarf figs. They'll come back later when they have fruit on them. Figs. Dwarf figs. So they don't make a tree or they're just a dwarf size. When you go in the sensory garden, you can see the big ones. Okay, well, I know what the big ones look like. I didn't know they had dwarf figs. And day lilies there. Now we're coming into the butterfly garden. Mm -hmm. 
Go ahead. I'm sorry. Excuse us. Uh, and this is with rutabagia. Look at the different colors. At the yellow and the, and the pinks. Mary, you might uh, kind of wait, I guess, for a, a group to come close to you. They're having trouble picking it up. Uh, okay. While, while, we're, while we're waiting for them, do you know the white one right there? Not on Facebook. Facebook. Oh, okay. No, we were, just saw that this morning. Right. And this, of course, is salvia, purple salvia. This is the butterfly garden. So, what we have in here specifically for butterflies. Oh, rain lilies popping up here and there. But that's what she has. We didn't know what the white was. It almost looks like an aspen. So sad. How did I look at it? Well, I know. I'm seeing that. I don't know. You can see that many colors in the same. We're coming into the part of your garden, garden you can see how formally it's laid out and very much uh, coordinated with its plantings. We still have some pansies around, but they'll be gone soon. And there's that gray color that I told you about. It has gray green. It's a Dusty Miller. And it has a surprising flower. We'll see one as we go further. Yes, they'll last. There's wonderful array of daisies. But you can see my wife, my teacher's We had gone to pick up Natalie at the airport, so it was early in the morning. So, okay, we're going to swing through over here. So, they had to find Here's the flower on the Dusty Miller. Would you have expected that? Not I. It's gorgeous. He's right. I think people tend to uh, flip it down or pull it out before you get to this point. <laughs> it's very unusual. Yeah, well, the bowl thing has a dust in there. I've never, I've never known it to do that. Mm -hmm. I think you don't. I think you use it quick and fast. Now we're coming into the rose garden. This is maintained by the Roy Rose Society. Are these usually uh, local species, local rose species? We have all kinds here and all of them are identified by a plaque. Some of them are antique. Some of them are very historical and some of them are new. Wednesday. So many that if we don't, that one's gone, we don't notice it. <laughs> but it is a beautiful space. And it, um, the cold really helped the roses this year. They were just spectacular. They're kind of going into a, a in season before they flush out again. 
you're right. Like our azaleas this year bloom fantastic. I mean, I think that the cold might help them die. Yeah, you're saying that that cold really helped the azaleas. It sure did. These are little small violas that they put among the roses to kind of add some interest in that garden bed. Unit of the Society of America. Now we're coming into the sensory garden. That's S E N S O R Y because it pertains to the five senses. And this is maintained by the Baton Unit of the American Earth Society. You can see each planting bed is identified with the native plants or Asian plants or Mediterranean cuisine. And I'd like to introduce you to Mary Williams. Hi, Mary. Hi. Uh, would you like to talk to them about your garden? Yes, yes. This is the Herb Society garden. It's called the Sensory Garden. Um, we've got nine beds here and each of them has a theme. We finally got those signs up on Thursday. That's my fault. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But you'll see, it's a word. When you talk about color in the garden, an herb garden's not the place to, to come and look, except you can tell with the texture of it. As long as you like green, you're in the right place. Um, we have some other things that are in bloom here, um, including some very nice, um, thank you, including some very nice um, Monarda. Most of you probably don't know much about Monarda, but it's one of my very favorite plants. And we have some in the lemon garden, which is just the next one over. Um, and there's some wild Monarda growing in this garden as well. But there are other kinds of Monarda that are gorgeous. It's in the lemon garden because you can make lemon tea out of the leaves. It's also a medicinal herb. And it comes in many, many colors. Um, the mint bed has got more mint. That's, I know the least about that mint. There are a few people um, in the far bed, here in the front, there's the Hispanic garden. We find the one that's so tight in it. Um, we try to go the fall from seed and it did not work. Um, but there are all kinds of other things in that garden that are, that are often used in Hispanic cooking. Of course, that's a big um, category. Um, and then there's the lemon garden bed, which is the second one over, and this one, which is native plants. Parts of the cave rosemary and thyme are already in there, but there are a lot of other English kinds of things there, including lavender, strawberries, and margarine, and onions in there. The far one is the Asian garden. We're learning as we go with that one. And we had a lot of um, richer fill in plants. Uh, but we're getting there. We do have holy basil in there. We have lemongrass in there and other things. We also have the six little trees here. And we also have a bunch of blueberry bushes in the two big outside beds. So we could do in the future. Are three little things that you can use? Blueberries aren't quite ripe. Uh, they're still kind of full blue. They're probably harvesting um, The strawberries are gone from here and gone from the Louisiana cooking bed. The berries are gone, but the little plants have, still, have got little, little flowers. So won't be long. We have enough flowers here to enchant pollinators. Um, that's the Mediterranean cuisine garden. We took about two square yards of, of um, oregano out yesterday, and I've got a, about a bushel of it at home. I'm going to be. That's 
that's um, a Monarda. It's a wild Monarda. There are labels here. What is this it's a, yeah, there are labels on the plants. Most of the yeah, plants in this whole garden have got labels. Uh, and that's called Mexican hat. Um, there we've got Mediterranean, you can see many mints, and then the two biggest gardens are healing plants and Louisiana cooking. We've even got tomato plants growing in Louisiana. Um, we've got little Two little, if you stand here in the middle of the axis, there are two at the far, in that far raised bed, the little trees on either side are peaches. And they will, they're, they're dwarf peaches and they will grow about six feet tall. They're just, we've only had them in about a year and a half. And those will eventually be very and they will grow to about six feet tall and they will eventually so then the next garden is down with the white post, white top post over there, and the matching one over to the right at the end of the Louisiana cooking. Those are little, our little comforts. In the in the far gardens, right here at the front, in the in the Asian garden over here to my left, and over there the Hispanic garden, there's a little tree right at the front, and that will get most of them. These are all natural dwarf trees. They won't get more than five six feet tall, but they and those are those are figs. They're the easier figs, which came as shoots cuttings. Um, brought over from from um, Sicily by the grandma or great grandma of the guy who's been growing them in his nursery. So we know about them. They're named after his grandma, great grandma, and they're they they, they look beautiful. And I thought they were beautiful. so. Those are fast growing, but they're they're going to be just delicious and wonderful. Uh, yeah. From um, seven to nine, because of the heat. And in December, it's usually eight to ten. Thank you very much, Mary. I appreciate you coming out here today. Mary, you want to do the next, the, the, the final guard? Okay. John, go. All right. Our final guard is in its uh, zenith this month, and that is the uh, Data Lake Garden. Uh, we have, uh, as far as I know, the, the best collection of data lays anywhere in South Louisiana. Uh, we have a very dedicated volunteer. Her name is Claire Fontenot, and she is here uh, Mondays and Fridays. So if you want to learn about growing data lays or have a particular variety, you'll find that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of different varieties of data lays uh, in our data lay garden here. So. If you'll just follow me, we'll proceed on to the daily garden, and that will be our final garden on this tour. As we as we move towards the daily garden, we'll, we'll come through the iris garden. Uh, we've missed the zenith of the iris blooms. They happen uh, in the month of April. Uh, we have a donation uh, that donated the Irish Pavilion. If you're ever looking for a small place to gather outside uh, and just possibly read a book or whatnot, uh, there's a large group there today, uh, but Freeport McMoran many years ago uh, donated the funds that helped make uh, this Irish Pavilion possible. There's lots of different donors uh, in this garden uh, that um, we have we probably haven't done the best job of always recognizing, but we do have nice signs out here now that recognize all the different uh, donor groups that volunteer uh, and uh, help maintain these gardens. 
starting in the database now. On the right, of my right, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Indigo. It does very well in the shade. This is this beautiful Iris Pavilion. Very nice shade spot on a warm day. Couldn't have done a better commercial for uh, <laughs> for the Iris Pavilion. A nice uh, group uh, working there or meeting there. If you have any interest in particular uh, irises or daylilies, uh, you'll notice there's a sign uh, by every one of these daylilies. So if you like one, you should be able to look at the, the sign. Um, we do have plant sales out here twice a year, uh, a spring and a fall. Uh, if you're a member of the Botanic Gar Friends of the Botanic Garden, um, you would get a newsletter from us announcing the fall uh, plant sale. And all, a lot of these varieties would be available for sale at our plant sale in the fall. So uh, I encourage you all to please join. Uh, the membership is just $10, but it's pretty good information about different things that are happening out there. I really have to applaud the effort of, of uh, you know, one lead volunteer being Claire Fontenot to have a map of every one of these data leads and her group of volunteers, again, on Mondays and Fridays, they uh, dig up and replant these every year because data leads do need to be divided, I've learned. Uh, after two or three years, they they uh, clump out just like ours do. So dividing is important to them. So we'll- Is it too late in the season to move them? Because we have some that are growing. I think you still can. Okay, just keep them watered. Yeah. Can you repeat that? Can you repeat that? Uh, he, he, the question was, is it too late to move them? Uh, I, if they're growing in a shady spot, uh, you can still move them uh, and they'll still put on buds. I moved some just about a month ago and they have since put on lots of buds and I think they should go ahead and flower. One thing I didn't know uh, about uh, irises as well as data lace is that they need a lot of sun. Uh, Miss Claire Fontenot gave a presentation for Garden Discoveries uh, two or three months ago. Uh, and it's a very, very good presentation you can find in that archive of Garden Discoveries uh, where she said that Irish need a lot of sun. I, I didn't know that. And so I'm consequently moving both my daylilies and my Irish to a more sunny location because I'm, I have zero luck with Irish. So crossing my fingers for next year. A few iris still blooming over here on the right. That's the reason I was asking because we have some that are in the sun and they rarely bloom. And the ones we moved into a shady location seem like they have, they have a lot more wet feet than than uh, than the sunny location. So. Quite a few more daylilies over on this side. We're standing right now in the smack middle of the Daylily collection. Uh, I might encourage you to, to come out and explore this entire property. 
Uh, there are about 13 different collections uh, and gardens in this in this Independence Park that the Breck does such a great job of maintaining. Uh, there is a sex couple, Wybo Alley. And if you look up the term sex couple, it never it doesn't seem to exist. item that takes place in this garden is called the Garden of Story. You'll see that feature in each publication of the story. This is maintained by the library staff. So it's uh, much like other things like uh, uh, Story Walk maintained, uh, done by the Junior League, but this is maintained by the library staff. They pick a book and then they break that book apart and have it at about, I don't know, 13 different stations at least in the garden. You can say just so it's a good place to bring a child to explore books and uh, visuals. We'll come back to this place in the shade and then that should conclude. There's a lot of demos along here to appreciate. It's a nice song, isn't it? He's telling us, come get in the shade. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that, I'm, we want to thank our presenter, Mary Tharp, uh, who is in the back somewhere. But uh, I'm gonna, we're going to conclude here and let you walk back in the library. But thank you all so much for coming. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.